All right. Um, so we are members of the Model United Nations team here at Hastings College, and today we're going to present about Model United Nations and our, the pathway to collaboration. So I'm Rebecca Riley, and I'm the head delegate of the team. I'm Corey Rive. I was a new team member this year. I'm Alexis Ferguson. I'm a returning member for this year. I'm Taylor Van Pelt, and I'm the finance chair. All right. So um, since a lot of you might not know what Model United Nations is. Um, Model United Nations is a simulation in which delegations or teams create a model United Nations. So we collaborate with other delegations or other schools and other countries to work, um, write working papers and then hopefully get those working papers passed into draft resolutions and then resolutions in the general assemblies and other committees. Um, so Hastings College attends National Model United Nations in New York annually and this conference is an annual conference with over 2,500 uh, graduate students and undergraduate students um, from over 50 countries. So that kind of gives you an idea about what Model UN is. So the research question that we're talking about today <coughs> is what happens when 2,500 college <coughs> students participate in a simulation of what the United Nations does on a yearly basis. So basically in four days, we do what the United Nations does in a year. So we try to take an agenda and make resolutions for that agenda and we resolve the issues on that agenda. We tr only resolve one issue in the course of the four days, but you know we try our best. So, <laughs> all right. So this year, um, at the beginning of the year in August, we set up a booth at the New Student Days um, Center for New Students, and we try to get a lot of new students to join our team. And we also try to get other returning students from other majors, um, not specifically in political science or the social science departments, to join our team. And we were successful in this effort. And because of this, um, our whole team has agreed that we are a better, better model UN because we have different opinions, different perspectives, and um, just a diverse amount of, um, amount of people on the team. Um, so as funders leader, I'm just going to talk to you about a little bit of the fundraising. Um, obviously, it's not cheap to send um, 13 people, including our sponsor, to stay downtown in Times Square, where we're required to stay. Um, and so we have to do a lot of fundraising. Um, one of the fundraisers that we do is the high school model United Nations. So um, we try to get students involved early. We get them on campus. Um, and so not only is it a community outreach to um, regional schools, um, but uh, it's also a fundraiser for us. Um, so we just want to thank the um, student association and the admissions for helping out with that. Um, we also have get a lot of our funding from an Applebee's fundraiser, so we just want to thank you to everybody who bought Applebee's tickets because I'm sure you probably had your door banged on um, asking for Applebee's tickets, but it really does help. Um, not everybody can pay to go to New York City for a week. It is like super expensive, including the foods and everything like that. Um, and so we try to send all the kids there um, with the, uh, no cost to them, um, including food. Um, and so, um, so far we have been successful at that. Um, we also want to thank um, the Exper Experiential Learning Grant and the Knappenbergers. Um, they are a big reason of why we um, got to go to New York City. And this year we were um, a little bit more relaxed. We weren't so tight on money, and so um, that's just a huge blessing that we had this year. Um, and we also want to thank Pan Nebraska. Um, it's Nebraska Model United Nations. They always hold a conference for us to help us get ready. Um, but they also um, donate money to our um, organization as well. So we also do a lot of research when we're preparing for this conference. Uh, so once we're assigned the country, and then we're assigned our individual committees that we're going to be working on for this, um, <coughs> we are given specific issues, and then we have to research what our country's perspective would be on those specific issues. So for example, the committee that I was in was the International Atomic Energy Association. So all of the research that I did was in terms of how Niger, which was the country we were assigned this year, would deal with like nuclear waste or nuclear power, those kind of issues. So um, once we finish all the research that we do, we have to write position papers. And this is basically like a two-page paper that writes out on each issue what our stance is. And then we turn those in in late February. And the Model or United Nations website makes it available about a week before the, concert, or before the conference so that other um, delegations can read our positions. When we all meet up for the conference, they know what countries have similar stances to them. So when we work on our resolutions, they can approach us and say, we read your guys' paper. We thought that your issues were really, really good. And then we can work together to work on a draft resolution. So I'm going to give you guys a little bit of background on um, Niger. <laughs> 
French is the official language, so the way that um, Nigerians would pronounce it is Niger. Sometimes you will hear Niger, but the English version. So Niger is one of the poorest nations with the UN um, Human Development Index rating it, or ranking it at 187th. It is also a landlocked country on the continent of Africa, guys. 80% um, of the land is actually too dry uh, to support vegetation. Two of its main agricultural exports um, are peanuts and cotton. Niger actually has an abundance of untapped resources such as gold, iron ore, and um, sulfates, just to name a few. Niger's lack of economic development um, has led to a steady net out migration. Uh, many Nigerians rely on subsistence farming. Um, so when you uh, couple that with the lack of arable land, the decline in rainfall, uh, food production really can't keep up with the high population growth. So the UN ranked Niger as the least developed um, country in the world uh, in 2015 due to the food insecurity, the lack of industry that is developed, the high population growth, the weak educational sector, and of course the few, the very few prospects for work. So all of which we were actually able to address in some shape or form during the research when um, the topics were given to our respective committees. So the International Atomic Energy Association, it's an international center for cooperation in the nuclear field. Um, its efforts involve promoting peaceful use of nuclear technologies. With uh, GA1, it deals with disarmament, um, global challenges, and threats to the peace that affects the international community. GA2 deals with issues, actually a variety of issues. Um, it relates to economic growth, sustainable development, financing development, just to name off a few there. Um, and GA3, its agenda items relate to a range of social, humanitarian um, affairs and human rights issues that affect people worldwide. In the United Nations Environment uh, um, Assembly, it addresses the critical environmental challenges that face the world today. It aims to build a healthier environment um, to support humanity for the generations to come. The High Level Political Forum provides political leadership, guidance, and recommendations um, for participating member states. It also promotes the integration of economic, social, and environmental dimensions of the sustainable development. So these um, committees are the ones that we participated in as a group. And Tori will go ahead and explain a little bit more in depth about what she did. So as I said before, I was in the International Atomic Energy Association, or the IAEA, and the three issues that were on our agenda for this conference were nuclear waste management, uh, nuclear safeguards in the Middle East, and um, working on improving science and technology activities through technical cooperation. <coughs> and the last one is the one that we decided to focus on for our issue. So uh, for our draft resolution, me and my partner worked with other Western African countries and small island nations to work on a draft resolution. And our resolution focused mainly on um, farming technologies for <coughs> nuclear um, capabilities. So we um, focused on using um, or improving farming and technology by working with countries who have established nuclear <coughs> programs like the United States, Germany, and France. Because they're developed nations, they have uh, very advanced nuclear technologies, whereas countries like Nigeria, which is a very, very underdeveloped country, does not. So we were hoping in our resolution that we would use technologies from those countries to aid in the farming issues of the underdeveloped countries in the world. Um, and then later on in the conference, we also um, came together with a group that was working on healthcare and nuclear technologies and healthcare advancement. And we ended up, before the final draft resolution was due, we combined our resolution with their resolution to form a better resolution that was more um, encompassing of the issues that we wanted to focus on. And so our final resolution that we turned into the dais, uh, the last day of the conference, had 27 sponsors on it, which is all the people that helped write that, and then 59 <coughs> signatories, which is all of the countries that agreed with what our position was, on top of the 27 countries that helped write it. And at the end of our session, we passed that resolution uh, by the whole committee. 
Okay, well, I was in General Assembly 2. Um, I was in Mile United Nations last year, and I was in General Assembly 2, and I just really liked the issues that it deals with. Um, primarily, um, GA2 really works with finance. You know, you have all of these great ideas on how to help, but if you don't have the money, um, there's really no way to make anything happen. Um, and so, um, obviously, Niger is very um, focused on financing for development. How can we make the best use of the money that we are given? Um, and so um, our um, group decided to um, tackle the issue of the Addis Ababa Action Agenda. And basically that encompassed a wide range of issues. Um, it actually included each and every one of the sustainable development goals, anything from women empowerment to um, finding sustainable education um, to finding sustainable water and energy. Um, and so we had a wide range of different resolutions going on. So no resolution was um, like another one, which really doesn't happen a lot because usually the topics um, kind of only have one resolution or um, really relate to each other. Um, and so the uh, res resolution that I worked on uh, was the creation of an annual report um, to create transparency. So basically transparency is the first way that you get um, big donor nations to donate. If they don't know that you're spending the money in wise ways, they're not going to want to give it to you. Um, also in the annual report, we uh, had a clause in there that said um, specific countries can donate to specific efforts. So if the United States um, wanted to donate specifically through farming and agriculture, you know, they can go and they can not only give money, but they can give knowledge, they can give wealth. Um, another one of my favorite parts of our resolution um, was our pay it forward clause. Um, basically saying that um, if you receive funds from um, another entity, from um, whatever kind of funding that you get, uh, that you need to pay it forward. Not necessarily in by financial means, but if you get all this information, um, you obviously gain an experience from um, the money that you are given. And so you need to pay that forward. You either need to help another country who is struggling that in that area, or you need to put the money that you gain to another effort. You need to do find some way to um, pay it for, forward. So um, I was very proud. Um, our resolution got passed um, with fine colors, and um, that was GA2. So my committee was the High Level Political Forum we, uh, on Sustainable Development, and we discussed the value of three topics. So we had youth leadership and education uh, for sustainable development, ensuring decent work for all, and the role of science, technology, and innovation in implementing the sustainable development goals. So we decided to prioritize youth leadership and education for sustainable development. We figured it would be easier to implement the other two into that as far as um, emphasizing youth education. And basically what our resolution advocated for was almost like an exchange program where you had students who would be willing to go over into least developed countries and gain some of that work experience um, with being able to really take charge and really head on um, the project there that they were, um, that they would basically t be a part of versus here, not so much. You kind of want to take the back burner and you have to follow in footsteps, you know, watch, pay attention, that type deal. It would really be putting <coughs> that student in a leadership role. All the while, those students who um, are from the least developed countries, being able to have that opportunity to be in a more developed country to actually have hands-on training with sustainable uh, practices in the agricultural realm, right? So you also get um, that leadership <coughs> role for students that is being, um, it's being cultivated, and you also get the uh, rich enrichment of that knowledge of how we can like really implement sustainable practices given that Niger is very poor and they have a heavy reliance on their agricultural sector. So that is something that we advocated uh, quite strongly. <laughs> and we actually had some dissension with our group. And we decided to break off from our own group. And through the networking skills that we picked up from Pan Nebraska that gave us um, some experience with that, you developed a level of comfortable, um, really confidence, actually with being comfortable with networking, using those skills, the whole idea of what you have to do at the Model United Nations, it's a lot of bargaining, right? And actually persuading people to um, 
take a stake in what you're advocating for. So I was able to transfer those skills that I learned from the Pan Nebraska into the actual conference. And um, it took some work, it took a couple of days to get people on board with what we were advocating for, but it worked out. We got enough signatories for our resolution, um, got enough people to support it, and it ended up passing. And um, what I also took from that was just learning when to take on that leadership <coughs> role and also learning when to take a step back when you see certain people starting to develop and, be, um, and try to step into that leadership role. So that is actually something that I took from the conference. All right, so I have an interesting situation for my um, conference this year. So originally I um, was part of General Assembly 3 and I researched all the topics and wrote a position paper on the topics for General Assembly 3, which as Alexa said, mostly focused on social issues such as LGBTI plus rights, um, uh, discrimination against older persons, and then the women's movement and women's rights. So I was really excited about those issues, but then I went to the conference and um, I decided to go through this process where I could have a chance to be on the dais, which is basically um, the leaders of the conference, so the chairs, the directors, and the rapporteurs, which are the secretaries. So I decided to go with this process and I had to go through several interviews and talk with all the directors of the conference and people that have been around in Mali United Nations for several years. And then I was hired to be the rapporteur for General Assembly, assembly 2, which was the assembly that Taylor and um, another student were in. So it was interesting to go from researching all of these topics and knowing a lot about them and then just forgetting all about all of that and stepping into a leadership position in a different assembly that I knew absolutely nothing about. Um, so basically my job as rapporteur was to be the secretary of the assembly. So I would go to all of the sessions, obviously, and I'd have to take detailed notes on exactly everything that happened, every motion that was called upon the floor, um, every time someone voted for something, I had to count all the votes, make sure everyone was present in the assemblies, and if they weren't present, um, tell their head delegate that they weren't present. Um, I also had to write a general um, summary report with the other rapporteur who was actually from Germany. So we had to write this very long paper about the entire uh, assembly and what was passed and the types of resolutions and the countries that participated and the countries that didn't show up. And so we had to stay attentive the entire time. Luckily, by the end of the conference, I had the opportunity to actually um, chair the conference because they let us all switch around because it's a learning experience. So um, I was really excited that I got to chair a national conference. Um, it was a great experience and I look forward to do it, doing it again. But some other things that I did during that were just, I felt like I was kind of an investigator because I had to go around and kind of spy on the groups. And um, they kind of thought I was another delegate. So sometimes they'd like come up to me and they'd just be like, hey, like you should join our group. And I just have to pretend that, I'd just be like, I'm sorry, I'm on the diet, so I can't talk to you. But um, I would go around and see where all the working groups were working and what types of topics they were working on and then um, the region, if there was a certain region associated with those topics and those groups. And then um, the director asked me to set up this type of spreadsheet graph thing. So I made like these circles and put what types of um, countries and what types of issues certain groups were focusing on, just so we could sort of help um, General Assembly to um, two's delegations find their working group because we saw that some people were having trouble collaborating with others. So those are some of the types of things I gotta do um, as a member of the dais. Um, so now we can look at a resolution example. We were talking about resolutions, but a lot of you probably don't know what exactly a resolution entails. A resolution, basically, um, so it would start out with the summary report, so what the rapporteurs wrote about everything that happened at the conference, and then um, it would start off with all of the resolutions that passed, and specifically in General Assembly 2, there was 13 resolutions that passed, and then basically the, um, the resolution example would just go on and on with all the phrases and clauses that the delegations wrote 
So there's a certain type of format you have to use, and there's certain words that are allowed and certain words that are not allowed. <coughs> basically, it's one entire sentence. There's no punctuation. And um, so they're just kind of clauses. So like emphasizes or encourages, those are examples of clauses that the resolutions use. So it's really interesting to um, write a resolution and get your resolution passed in any assembly. And um, luckily, a lot of our um, resolutions that people from our delegation worked on passed in their assemblies. So we're really proud of them. Um, so this year at our conference, we received the Distinguished Delegation Award. Um, the only the top 20% um, of all the colleges there can actually receive an award. Um, last year was our first year getting an award, and we got honorable mention, which is a step below um, distinguished delegation. Um, and so we are, there's one more tier um, up higher, and so um, we are kind of in the middle, but we are very excited. Um, we are a smaller school, so it is harder to get those awards. Um, things you have to do to get those awards, you have to um, speak in front of your whole entire assembly. You have to um, be constantly present, be constantly voting. Um, Helping out the dais. There's things you can do to um, like be pages and pass notes because you're not allowed to talk um, during formal session and things like that. So um, you really have to be active um, leaders in order to uh, get this award. Um, also, it's a really big um, blessing that we got this award because our team is so young. Um, I think we had four or five returning members out of the 12, and so. It is really hard to teach such a young team and to, you do, the young members really did get thrown into it because there's not a lot we can do to replicate um, what it's like to speak in front of 400 people or anything like that. And so um, I couldn't be more proud of them. Um, of course, they are the reason that um, we did so well and we do have uh, more returning members. And so um, we are looking to um, reach that top award, but um, I am very proud of um, what we accomplished. So um, to conclude, we found that collaborating um, with other groups is what creates well-rounded policies um, when in the simulation and also in the real United Nations. Um, also, we learned the importance of staying in character. So that means staying true to the beliefs of the country you're representing. Just because once you start compromising your beliefs, especially in model United Nations, the policies begin um, to become irrelevant and unfocused. So those are um, two of the main things that we learned. Yeah, we also made a lot of connections. So when you're working in groups, um, our group had, like I said, 27 sponsors. So there was 27 people that we were working on to write this whole resolution. So you learn a lot about those different countries and their different perspectives on these global issues, which I found really interesting because as an American, we tend to focus on like other large nations. So when I was working with countries like Kuwait and Haiti and smaller nations, I learned a lot about how they view the world issues in a completely different perspective from what Americans tend to view those issues from. Uh, we also got the opportunity to experience a lot of different cultures. There's uh, about 50 different countries who have colleges that go to this conference. So you'd work with people from a lot of different parts of the world. I had people from Venezuela and Germany and Nicaragua in the group that I was working with. And it was really interesting because they would actually bring like food from their country to our assembly meetings and they would like have you try it. So I got to try like chocolate from Venezuela and like different kinds of candy from Germany, which was really interesting because you get to hear their perspectives on their uh, countries and then you get to see what their culture is like. So that's actually a really interesting part of what the conference does. So moving forward, just increasing that team membership, going back to making sure we remain diverse, um, especially if when you're thinking about the benefits of having an English major on the team and really having them take charge as far as writing and that actually came well like in hand. Um, we're just going to, and also really making it a point to advocate a little bit more as well especially when people are asking about different things just really having that on our minds. Um, another thing we want to do is <coughs> increase conference attendance. Um, we have almost doubled in size since Mali Nation started. They had six members <coughs> go. Um, so obviously, we'd like to see more and more people um, join our conference. Um, again, that means we um, are going to need to fundraise more and do more stuff. Um, but one of the things that um, Mali United Nations does is every year there are one or two um, kind of destination locations where the conference is held. So there's two conferences held in New York City, but then there's two destination locations. 
Um, this year's the Galapagos Islands and um, Japan. And so I really think that it'd be a good experience. Not only are you going to the United Nations and you're working with all these people, but you're also thrown into another culture um, that likely speaks a different language and stuff. So I just think that that would be um, a really cool thing for the team um, to get to experience. So we're working on that as well. We also want to increase um, campus involvement. So we're a very small organization because there's only 12 of us, but we'd like to have a better um, presence on campus and people so they can know what we do, they can come see what we uh, do with our uh, high school conference is one way that we got our name kind of out there this year. We had high schoolers from different parts of Nebraska come participate in a mock conference. And we also had um, a couple intro classes from the political science department participate as well. So they kind of got to see like what a conference is like on a small scale and we actually had some people uh, decide to join off of that conference. We also want to um, participate in the multicultural festival that they have in uh, the fall every year um, and hopefully take um, you know, stuff from our uh, country that we uh, represented at the conference and bring food and different cultural things to that so that we can share what we learn as well as uh, get the campus involved in what we're doing. All right, so finally, um, our whole team agrees that we want to continue our tradition of excellence um, in the past four years, Hastings College Model UN has done really well and we're only getting better. So we want to continue to um, recruit people to join our team and continue to travel to conferences, host conferences, and then even go to conferences in Nebraska with other colleges. So um, looking into the next few years, um, no matter the battles that we may face, we just want to keep persisting and creating leaders both at the conference and on our campus at Hastings College. And I just want to say, um, Rebecca Riley did a lot of work this year. Um, she kind of got thrown into the president position. Um, we got a brand new um, Liz Fromgen stepped in because Dr. Vega left, so we had a brand new sponsor who really didn't know much about the conference either, and so she really took on that role like a champ. Um, she spent eight plus hours a week, um, anything from buying plane tickets to making the hotel reservations, you know, she did it all, and so, um, I just want to thank you um, on behalf of the team for all your work. Thank you. All right. Um, so we have a couple minutes left. So is there any questions that anyone has? Uh, question? Yeah. So like on average, like I know she just said, you spent personally a lot of time, like a lot of hours every week. How like, a, like just like an average member, how would you say like how much time do you spend on Model UN? Um, I would say it depends on like if you have a leadership position. So obviously I'm like in charge of like fundraising and stuff. So around the time that fundraisers are, like that's a little bit more um, time consuming. Um, because you have like the whole fall to prepare for the one conference, and um, it really isn't terribly time consuming. Um, if you, any of you want to join Molly and I Nations, uh, come talk to us. <laughs> We'd be happy to have you. Um, but we like to have people um, in our group that are really involved in other things, so we don't want to take up so much time that yeah. um, you can't be involved in those other things. So um, I would say I in the fall, um, we have meetings maybe once or twice a month in the fall, and we just start picking the countries that we think we might want to represent. And then um, once we start getting closer to the conference, we had a meeting every week, and then we had our position papers due. So that was something that every member really had to commit to. So, um, but we also set goals like in December to have um, a topic done. So which is like half the paper or a third of the paper done for each time. So if you split up your work, it really would only be a couple or hour or so at the most per week for a student yeah. that didn't have a leadership position. Yeah. How are colleges assigned um, uh, assigned countries? Is so it something that you submit mm -hmm. or is it uh, strictly <coughs> to you. Um, so the NM, <coughs> National Model United Nations gives us a list of countries um, with numbers of people that are coming. So you could have six to eight people or eight to ten or this year we were like ten to fourteen. Um, so we had to bring ten people but and at the most fourteen and then from that there's a list of countries probably like twenty countries and then you pick your like top six and then based on um, previous co um, conference contributions and attendance then they kind of go off of that and um, last year we picked Mauritania as our first and we got that, but then this year we didn't get our first choice. So mostly um, the way we pick it is we just look at the, um, the committees that each country is assigned to and see if we're interested in any of those specific committees. So it's kind of a process. What was your first choice? Our first choice this year was Somalia because it was in the Habitat Committee and we were all really interested in that. And obviously the more members that we get, the more powerful of a nation yeah. we can be to. Um, so it would be kind of fun. We do usually pick African mm -hmm. countries because you kind of have like a little 
like I want to say like gang, you know, you have a bunch of African countries that all are dealing with the same issues that you're dealing with, so you can kind of find your group um, a little bit more easily. Um, and so I think it'd be good yeah. to kind of expand our horizons a little bit by getting more members and then we can be, you know, a little bit bigger nation. Yep. Yeah. So if a student wanted to try this, just sort of get their toes in, which course would they take in the, in the fall <laughs> to, to get a taste? Intro to politics. Intro to politics. politics. In, oh, right. Or comparative yeah. politics. Mm -hmm. Advanced foreign policy. Intro to comparative politics. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Take an intro, intro course. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Modern global class, great families. <laughs> It'll be taught by our new professor. So. Right. If you want to meet her, she seems really cool. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <coughs> Wait, one more. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. <coughs> How many majors were represented on the team this year? Um, I'm an advertising major. Poli sci. <laughs> um, I'm a double major, so I'm a music major and a political science major. And she's a sociology major. Yeah, I'm major. double major in poli sci yeah. and sociology. We also had English, history, economics, economics um, bu business, like Taylor said. So we have, like, from all different places. We <coughs> don't really have a science major yet, but we're kind of working on that. We do have a math major, though. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Working on media, getting yeah. yeah. those media people. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> you learn new things every day. <laughs> We're going to do more. more. <laughs> Thank you for coming to our presentation. Did you have a question? Wait. No. Wait, I thought there was one more. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>